This message comes from NPR sponsor Frick Madison, the temporary home of the Frick Collection. For a limited time, experience masterpieces from the Renaissance to the early 20th century reframed in the iconic Breuer Building on New York's Upper East Side. Explore the special exhibition Bellini and Giorgione in the house of Taddeo Contarini. Frick Madison, classic art, modern setting. Open Thursday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Reserve tickets at frick.org. Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash get100 and use code get100. That's code get100 at prizepicks.com slash get100 for a first deposit matchup to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Hello and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion. With me, your host, Stephen Wallace. Coming up, we have the first of two podcasts looking back at the recent men's 50-over World Cup. Our opening show features the former England international, Roland Butcher, a regular on this podcast and now a West Indian selector who gives his insightful opinions on why Australia won, England failed so badly, along with his thoughts on the other teams at the global event. In a wide-ranging podcast, Roland looks ahead to England's white ball tour of the Caribbean, which begins on the 3rd of December, gives his own tribute to the legendary Indian slow bowler Vishen Bedi, who recently passed away, before predicting the winner of the 2024 T20 Men's World Cup. Hello, Roland. Welcome back to the paddock and the pavilion to talk cricket and review the Men's World Cup. Stephen, great pleasure to be back as always. And, um, after such a riveting event, it's good to be able to have a chat about it. How's uh, sunny Barbados? Or is it sunny? It is. Um, very much so. Very warm. Um, some would say a little too hot, but I would prefer what I'm experiencing here at the moment to what you are experiencing at the moment. Yes, it's expected to get a bit colder here in the next uh, week or two. But before we start on the World Cup, You've been involved with um, promoting girls' cricket in Barbados, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I've got a project that's about to start. On the 8th of December, we'll be launching the Barbados Royals Girls Cricket Club, um, which is for girls between the ages of 6 and 14. Um, So we'll be operating four different age groups since 6 to 8, 8 to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 14. And the idea really of this is to give the girls an opportunity to play the sport of cricket, which is, as you know, is expanding rapidly around the, the world in terms of women's cricket. And to also, you know, give them a chance to be part of a team, um, which eventually will, you know, help their overall development as well. The emphasis is not going to be so much on trying to produce stars. It's more on giving Gives the opportunity to play, experience the game, grow into it, and then really, if they like it and want to go further and have a career, then a system in that. Very fortunate to have the Barbados Royals, which is a CPL franchise, come on board as as a sponsor and back for a chance. The UK based sports charity, which I've been working with for a number of years now, um, they're very much part of this project. So. Looking forward to developing something that eventually will make Barbados proud, not just in terms of its citizens, but I think it will produce some Barbadian players and ultimately West Indian players. So really looking forward to it. And got a good team behind me. Um, Really, it's a club that will be run 
primarily by women because it is for women and you know there will be some men involved and but I'll be more on an advise, advisory role and they will run themselves and um and we will see the results and the Barbados Royals have got Hayley Matthews one of the leading women players in the world yes well obviously Hayley you know is a very much a product of the limited system we have here in Barbados. She was one of the fortunate, fortunate ones to have come through the system. Now she's reached the very pinnacle. So she really has a big role to play as a, a shining current uh, role model um, for the young ladies to show that, you know, with hard work, perseverance, that, you know, you can live the life that Haley's living right now and travel the world and play the, the game that's made the West Indies famous. It's happened over the years with the, with the men. Um, up to 2016, as you know, the women's game was, was going well because West Indies won the World Cup, Women's World Cup in 2016. Um, they want to get back to those heights. So Haley Matthews is a, a really good role model for them. And this is back for, back for a chance. Will Gaffney, who's also been on this podcast. Yes, I mean, as you know, Will is... a uh, a dynamic young man uh, who started this charity age 14 after a visit to Sri Lanka, um, was really torn apart by what he saw in Sri Lanka, the need, and he just really wondered how he could assist. And obviously cricket is something that he loved. Uh, came back to UK, started this charity to try and assist people in Sri Lanka in terms of kit and since then, obviously, the charity has grown where he is. You know, he's helped people in Afghanistan. He's, he's working with Eber Qureshi in Pakistan. Um, Gary Kirsten in South Africa. We did a project here in Barbados a couple of years ago, which now has led to the, to the Barbados Royals Girls Cricket Club. And, you know, he has many other projects that he's been funding over the last four or five years. So... Really a dynamic young man. Still, I think he's just really finished his, his exams now. So that tells you that, um, you know, the sort of efforts that he's put in, in between going to school as a schoolboy. Well, let's get, concentrate on the uh, the Cricket World Cup. I wanted to start with the final. Uh, we had 48 matches. Well, it, it was the 48th match. Nearly seven weeks. Watched by over a, a million people in the grounds. And undefeated India went to the final and and they lost. Uh, was it a brave call on the day for Pat Cummins to put the Indian side in? I wouldn't say brave. I would say smart. Um, you know, I felt always Australia was the side. If a team was going to beat India, it was going to be Australia. Um, India really performed out of this world and you always feel that there's always one bad game you're, you're hoping as a team it doesn't come when it comes at the, in, at the last hurdle but yeah Cummins obviously made a decision that he wanted his bowlers to use the pitch first and if he was able to restrict India to a reasonable total then he backed his players to, to chase the total down thinking also that the pitch would get better did the catch by Travis Head when he caught Rohit Sharma, was that a key moment in the match? It would have been one of the moments. I don't, to say whether well, it's the key moment is, is another matter because um, it was an excellent catch. And as the saying goes, you know, catches win matches and, and, catch, and drop catches lose matches. Um, if you go back to the, the previous game where... Australia were dead and buried and, and Maxwell got dropped. And that drop catch cost the field inside the game. Um, on this occasion, good catch taken by Head. What it really did was it then galvanised Australia to dig a little bit deeper and really was the, the catalyst for what happened later on. But this, whether it was the pivotal moment, um, it's difficult to say, but what I would say, it was a significant moment in the game. It brought back memories of uh, Kapil Dev catching, uh, although it was a different stage of the game, when he caught Viv Richards way back in 1983. 
Yes, I mean, you know that, you know, Robert Sharma is a very dangerous player. Um, he's an all format player um, and he's top in all of those areas as a player. So, you know, to get his wicket when they did um, was crucial because he has the ability to take the game away from the opposition and do it very quickly. Did the Indian side then back too conservatively or had they got to allow for their longer tail than uh, other sides? I think they were put under pressure um, and they had to play the situation. I don't think there's a lot much else they could have done because, you know, Australia were very much on top of their game. Um, you know, the early bowling with Hazelwood, et cetera, were, you know, it was very, very tough. So it, India really had to tough it out. I don't think they had um, much chance to just go after the bowling. Um, Australia really upped the pressure and created um, that pressure in the middle. Obviously, in, India would have been wary that if they would have lose three or four wickets in the early exchanges, then, as you said, that lower middle order, um, which is not tried and tested, um, would have come under pressure. So they had to bat quite conservatively um, in that in that middle period. Were you impressed with the way Pat Cummins handled his bowling attack? He used seven bowlers. Yeah, well, he's you know he's growing in it, you know, as a captain, you know, he's he's learning all the time. I think what he had to do in this game was to not become too predictable and let India get used to the same bowlers all the time. So conditions were favourable and. It made sense to, you know, change up the bowling so that the batters just couldn't get used to a bowler that have to start all over again, and and it worked. That's the important thing. And India's final score of two forty. Did you think that would seriously test the Australian side? Well, it, it started off when they were forty seven for three. No, even at forty seven for three, I didn't think it was going to be enough. Um, it certainly was a below par score. You must remember Australia as a country. Australia have been to many World Cups and they've won many World Cups. So how to win World Cups, they know exactly what to do. At the halfway stage, I'm sure they would have said in the dressing room that bowlers have done a great job and all the betters got to do now is to form two partnerships and we'll win this game. And that's exactly what they did. Well, they certainly had one major partnership, 192 between Travis Head and Marnus Labersham. How impressed were you with the two different approaches by those two batsmen? Yeah, they read it perfectly, didn't they? Um, I think, as I said, the fact they knew they weren't chasing 300. Um, so they always would have believed that to get 240-odd, you know, they just had to bat reasonably well. They didn't have to bat outstandingly well to get that just had to bat reasonably well. Um, they gambled also that conditions would improve for batting, and that worked very much in their favour. But they always had enough, I think, in the in the shed, really, to, to get a total like that. That partnership really was game-defining because it, it really broke the, the heart and spirit of the, of the Indian team. And you could see long before the end that they were a beaten team. You could see that um, in their body language. And no wickets for the Indian spinners. Yeah, again, because conditions not that helpful. Um, and batters prepare to dig in and, and don't be too extravagant. So Australia played it perfectly. Um, Lavashan was always going to be the sheet anchor. He was, you know, work it around, run hard, prepare to bat soak up pressure, back for long periods. And, you know, he knew that if the game went the full distance, that Australia would win. So I would imagine that first and foremost in their minds was to just occupy the crease. And by occupying the crease, you know, they will get to the target. Another area where the Australians were very strong uh, early on in the match, or throughout the match, was their fielding. And as a Excellent fielder yourself. You must have, have noticed that. Yeah, well, listen, um, if you're in the field first, you know, 
you have to set the tone for the rest of your game. I mean, if if you're on top of your game in the field, the encouragement that that gives to the bowlers, you just cannot imagine. Um, we know Australia have got some good fielders and they put in there a lot of pressure. And by fielding well, you know, that would have spurred on, you know, here's the wood and others to, to give a big performance. You know, as you know, fielding, fielding is a very important part of, of, of cricket. Before I know, um, its importance is no less um, in this modern era of cricket. Um, it is even more so now because you've got um, within a team, you've got a greater number of, of good fielders than perhaps you had in the past where a team would have two or three good fielders. I think now, generally, um, the standard of fielding is very good because they have to work very hard. They're playing different formats of the game, which also helps with the fielding. So, and Australia always have been a team that pride themselves on fielding well. So that didn't surprise me. I'd like to go on a chat about um, England and the other teams, but just on another point, do you think the best team won the tournament? Because India had won all nine group matches. They bowled out Sri Lanka for 55. They bowled out South Africa for 83. And Australia had, had lost two of their group matches. What I would say is, I would say the best team won the World Cup. The best team on paper didn't win the World Cup. I would say on paper, India was the best team on paper. Australia was the best team when it mattered, uh, which was the final. Um, they had some lucky escapes, poor start, um, then that hiccup when they could have lost. And then, you know, to get the job done in the final. So I would say, yep, the best team won, won it because you can't say the worst team won it. The best team won it, but the best team on paper I think was India, and and they didn't. Well, one of the best teams on paper were England, and um, after the tournament, uh, former England captain Michael Atherton, Atherton said, "We were slow to adapt to fifty over cricket." Is is that one of the reasons why England performed so badly? It is, and England should have known that. I think what really happened with the England setup, whether consciously or unconsciously. I, I think there was a certain degree of arrogance um, in the approach to this World Cup because if you think to the to the last World Cup, 2019, when England won that World Cup, I think in the four-year period leading up to that, England played something like 80... Um, 89. 89 matches during that period, in the four-year period. Now, in this period here leading up, particularly the last year, um, which is also very important because it's just before the tournament. They played three or four or three or four mm. in the last year, leading into a World Cup on foreign soil against a formidable opponent like India in their own backyard. Australia, who are used to winning World Cups. Um, some New, New Zealand, who's always going to become competitive some emerging sides and the belief that you're just going to walk into India and just put your bags down, perform and win the tournament was a bit naive and arrogant. And you see what happens when that type of thinking sets into an outfit. Um, the result is exactly what happens. So to me, England, in many ways, whether it was conscious or unconscious, I think they disrespected the, the sport in that in that area and got off to a bad start, could not recover because they just didn't have enough games really in their legs. By the time um, they started to catch themselves, it was too late, tournament's over. And is that how so many batsmen can get out of form altogether? Because Bairstow, Butler and Root, apart from the first two games my last game, completely stop scoring runs in the heart of the competition? Well, not, not just batsmen. I mean, bowlers can can get out of the ry rhythm as well. I mean, if you're not playing the format at the international level, where it's high, inten you know, it's high inten intensity, you're playing against top players, you can't just roll up and, you know, churn up the performances. It just doesn't happen. So whether we're bat or ball, 
you know, you have got to be match ready. Um, it's like it's like going on tour, and you arrive in the in the country two days before, and you start the test match in two days' time. I mean, are you really ready and prepared in those conditions for what's ahead of you? Certainly not. Um, I did not expect that England would win this tournament. Um, I felt obviously they didn't have enough mileage in the in, in the in the tank in terms of of matches, and they were going to be severely tested against the best teams in the world. Were England trying to play T Twenty cricket within a fifty over game almost? No, I, I think England tried to play the game that they have played for the last four or five years. But as I said, the slight difference is that four or five years ago they had matches under their belt. They were match ready. This time they tried to play the same game, but with not the, the, the mileage. Um, for me, that was the real problem. I'm sure the, play, the players tried as hard as they could. I, I'm absolutely certain that each and every player would have tried their damnedest best to perform, whether it be the bat or ball. But the Jets were not able to do it because... You know, they were not conditioned and ready to do that. If they were playing for another month, I am absolutely certain that England would have got a lot better if they played for another month after that. There were some of the England players coming to the end of their time of um, ODI cricket. Well, you can, we're looking at the, on the face of it, you know, you can perhaps think that, you know, this may be the last running for a number of players because. You know, after every World Cup, you really have to look to the next one. You have to decide, well, who are my players that's going to be around and effective in time for the next World Cup? So that happens with every side that at the end of the World Cup, there's reflection on where you're at, um, where you want to go, and what you need to do in order to get there. So you will see in most teams that there will be changes because... Um, some players will be perhaps the wrong side of a certain age and, you know, decisions may be made to move on and, you know, introduce younger players uh, within the period so that they can become accustomed to that level of competition when the next World Cup comes around. Missing Ben Stokes for the, I think, the first four games, that couldn't have helped the side? It couldn't have helped the side. Um, but there's another school of thought as to whether the side was hurt by the inclusion of Ben Stokes. You don't know that. Um, you remember Ben Stokes had retired. Um, I would imagine he would have been cajoled into playing. Um, you just don't know how that could have affected the dressing room in terms of, of players where... You know, you're forcing someone who's clearly not 100% fit, you know, to come and play in a tournament as big as the World Cup. So, obviously, Ben came not fully fit and not being able to play in those early matches, which England obviously lost and, and, and got into such a, a state that even in returning Ben Stokes, um, still would not have been 100% fit, but a returning Ben Stokes would have still found it difficult to drag the team up from where they had been um, for those first four games. They, in fact, could have been the only side to beat India because we, or England, did dismiss India for 229 in the group match. Yeah, I mean, listen, you, you, the World Cup shows that you know, you don't have to play your best cricket all the time in order to win the World Cup. Um, there are certain times that you do need to play your best cricket. Um, if you look at the way this series started for Australia, after two games, um, you would probably start to scratch your head and wonder whether they were going to make the playoffs. They put some results together, got themselves in a position, and then almost had... It taken away from them again. That drop catch from Maxwell saved the day. And after that, obviously, they do what they do. In those circumstances, they're 
know when the, the big moments come, like semifinals, etc. So the point that I'm making is that you do not have to play your very best cricket from ball one from day one to win a tournament. But at some point in the tournament, you do have to play your best cricket. We saw India play the best cricket right through till the final um, and lost. So, you know, that proves my point. Talking of preparation, what do you think to the fact that the England players don't play any domestic 50 over cricket? Does that harm their chances when they come to play international 50 over cricket? Well, what I would say is uh, I know these days the demands on players are immense because as well as your domestic cricket and your international schedules home and away, obviously you've still got all of these different franchise tournaments taking place around the world. So, you know, the players, you know, they're stepping off planes here and there, going to a different tournament. In doing all of that, the calendar, you know, a year is still only 365 days. So what is happening year in, year out is that you just fit in more and more time, more and more games into that already crowded schedule. And as a result, you know, certain formats uh, will get squeezed. Um, because of those demands, it means that domestically, the England players cannot really play as much of the competition domestically as possible, which leaves them a bit short. The other thing is you're not also you're not playing also in bilateral series. You're not playing the volume of cricket that you used to play in the past. You know, most more series now are, you know, it might be three test matches, a few ODIs, a few T20s. Uh, as you know before, the schedule was much longer. All the formats, you had m- many more matches. So it's much more difficult now, um, you know, to manage that process. And, you know, England are putting more and more tournaments on themselves domestically. So that's something they're going to have to live with in the future and and work around it. So you really think it was England's lack of preparation? We we actually played 42 one-day internationals since the last World Cup, as opposed to 89 before the, the 2019 World Cup. Yeah, listen, preparation, preparation is the key. And preparation doesn't start when you turn up at a tournament. Uh, if preparation starts, then you're over the tournament. You've lost already. Preparation starts immediately after a tournament. So preparation for England would have started, and all the teams would have started after 2019. Uh, this one's just finished now. Preparations have to begin now for 2027. If you don't prepare um, in that four-year period and you come into the last year to want to start your preparation, um, you would have to be very, very lucky uh, to be successful. Probably the only bright spots for England, statistically-wise, was uh, David Milan with 404 runs opening the batting. But... Adil Rashid again was the best bowler. He was fifteen wickets in the in the competition. Yeah, but yeah, Milan had a good tournament, didn't he? Um, you know, he he. I think a, pro- a problem for England was that they didn't get a lot of good starts, and you know, if, if you don't get good starts, particularly in that power player power player, you know, it sets the team back and. You know, they were losing a wicket or two in that power play, which then created pressure um, in the middle order. But uh, Milan, yeah, he certainly had a good, he had a good tournament. He can, he can be quite happy with what he did. And Adel Rashid with his 15 wickets, he continues to impress. Yeah, well, Rashid obviously now has, we know that he only plays a few formats. So, you know, he's comfortable in doing that. Um, I think T20, you know, he is a format that he likes and, and 50 over. So he enjoys the role in limited overs where he has to bowl a certain number of overs 
um, yes, he continues to perform at a, at, a, at a high level. Well, England eventually finished seventh. We qualified for the Champions Trophy. Looking towards some of the other teams, Pakistan, your prediction, they came fifth. Yeah, Pakistan for me was a real disappointment. Um, I felt this year, World Cup, that they would have been the dark horse in the pack. Um, maybe they've, they're still the dark horse because you're just not sure what to expect. I thought they would have performed a lot better um, in this tournament. I'm not sure the reasons why. I don't think they are. I don't think they're a bad side. I think they have a lot of very talented players. Uh, it just didn't come together um, in this tournament. But I felt going into the tournament that there would have been a team that you would have had to, to watch. Once again, New Zealand, very consistent, reaching the semifinals. Yes, um, expecting New Zealand would have been around there because New Zealand, you know, New Zealand do play some very, very good cricket. Um the good thing for New Zealand this year is that they were able to unearth some new talents as well. So, you know, with that, uh, it didn't help having the captain injured for for so long. Um, so, Ken Williamson obviously didn't come in until later in the tournament. But you always expect um, a New Zealand team to, to punch above their weight, and, and they did. Yeah, one of those stars, Ravindra, scored 578 runs. Uh, the Fourth leading scorer in the tournament. Fantastic. I mean, for a young man playing his first World Cup on foreign soil, soil um, fantastic. I mean, that argues well for, for New Zealand that they have perhaps on earth, you know, a rising star. And South Africa very nearly reached the final. Well, that was a surprise team for me, South Africa. Um, I would say that at the start of the tournament, I personally didn't really fancy them as a team to go that far. Um, I think they surprised me and a lot of people. Um, they played some good cricket. And obviously, getting to the semifinals is, is no mean feat. You know, they had to play a lot of difficult matches and overcome them. And, you know, all credit to them. They didn't get over the, the line, but I think they can go back home feeling that, you know, they did a good job. Nobody expected them to, to go that far. Well, they won seven of their nine group matches. They got to a bowled out for was it 83 by India. But Quinton de Kock scoring four centuries in the competition. Yeah, de Kock was on form, wasn't he? I mean, you know, himself, Van der Dissen and, and Klassen, uh, you know, really came to the fore in this tournament and showed that there is potential uh, for South Africa to grow as a team. And um, as I said, South African supporters should really be very proud of, of what their team achieves. What did you make of Afghanistan? Four wins should have really been five. Afghanistan, for me, was one of the, the shining lights um, in the tournament. You know, their progress, um, we've always known that, you know, the bowling attack, particularly the spin bowling attack, is very good. But what we saw in this tournament is that uh, we saw the emergence of some of their batters and, and pace bowling. So definitely they have made significant gains um, in this World Cup. And I think most cricket-loving people who watch the World Cup would also agree that you know, they thoroughly deserved where they finished. And that can only argue well for Afghanistan cricket in the future. Well, they beat England and Pakistan amongst their victories. Uh, and, of course, they, they narrowly lost to Australia, even though they had nine, Australia 91 for seven. The yes, innings I mean, by Glenn Maxwell, was that the best ODI innings you've ever seen? Well, I would say it was one of the best in the context of, of the importance of the game and the situation that Australia was in, you would have to say it was the best because 90 out of 7, um, you got to get another 200, you're, you're, it's all over. You know, you just don't come back from that sort of thing. So, so 
somebody would have to play an extraordinary innings for you to win. And Maxwell did it pretty much handicapped. He wasn't a fit Maxwell. Um, you know, he had all sorts of problems while at the crease, but somehow he just still managed to play some incredible shots. In doing that, in order to win, you do need a stroke of luck. He has a few strokes of luck. Um, but you can't take anything away from him. His ball striking was second to none. And at the end of the day, really, Afghanistan would have felt, you know, really disappointed because they were in the driving seat. You know, they batted well. They put up a really good performance. And it needed something that perhaps we'll not see in our lifetime again um, to take that game away from them. The final team I wanted to ask you about was the the Orange Army, who uh, beat South Africa. Uh, they also beat Bangladesh. That's two test-playing nations. Uh, how well did the, the Netherlands do? Again, the Netherlands must, Netherlands must go away with a lot of credit. Um, you know, they're on the big stage. Their cricket improved. You know, they beat a couple of the big sides. So they must go home feeling that, you know, the World Cup for them was a step in the right direction. The Netherlands, for me, and Afghanistan were the two sides who would have gained the most, I think, out of this this World Cup in terms of teams that are not highly ranked. But, you know, they have shown that they can compete, you know, in a one-off game, particularly against the big sides, that they can compete. So, Netherlands, I think they got everything to be proud of. Um, and, you know, they should be looking forward, really, to to where Netherlands cricket can go in the future. So if you could pick a batsman of the tournament and a bowler of the tournament, who would you choose? Um, for me, the established players, I would expect the established players to do what they did. So the Coley's, um, the De Cox, you know, the Daryl Mitchells, all of these guys... I would expect them to do what they did. But for me, I'm going to choose uh, a young batsman in Ravindra as, you know, the young star in this in this tournament as a batter, for sure. Because here was an unknown with limited experience stepping onto the biggest stage in the world against the top teams in the world in his first tournament. And emerging as one of the major players in the tournament. So for me, he would be the young player. I think also, I like the look of um, the guy, Dilshan Majashanka, left arm pace bowler for, for Sri Lanka. I think he's age 23. Definitely a good find. Um, you know, he had an excellent tournament. And so for this tournament, really, um, I'm not going to um, talk about Corley and, and the others, but those two young players for me, I think are players that have emerged with a tremendous amount of credit and have got bright futures ahead. Yeah, Madhushanka, 21 wickets behind Zampa with 23 and Shami with 24. Yeah, excellent. I've got a few questions now. Um one from Jenny Thompson, who's on her world cricket tour. I don't actually know where she is at the moment. She's all over the world playing cricket and uh, finding out where cr- you didn't think cricket was played. Uh, and she, uh, her question is, do you think the Cricket World Cup made ODI cricket more relevant again? Well, for me, it's always been relevant. Um, whether it's made it more relevant, I, I really don't know. But what I would say um, is that ODI cricket really is the bridge between T20 and Test cricket. I don't believe that you should interfere with that in any way. Um, if you remove the bridge, I think both forms of the game, Test and, and T20, will suffer. That is the halfway point, really. It's longer than T20. And it's shorter than Test cricket. So for me, it is the perfect fit because I think in order to be a 
good fifth year of a cricketer, it is best to be also a good test cricketer. And this tournament has proved that. If you look at the you look at the players who have performed very well in this tournament, and you will see that most of them have got a strong test base in their game, whether bowler or batsman. Right. Much harder for the T20 player only to be a top player uh, at the 50 over. So for me, it's important to, I know there's been a lot of talk about wanting to get rid of it, but I, I am fairly sentimental in that I believe it, it is the bridge um, that holds the other two together. And the other reason why we want it there is that if you get rid of 50 over cricket, then it will kill the likes of all the associate nations that have ambitions to, number one, get ODI status, and two, um, to play in a World Cup. They are going to struggle if they're only playing T20 cricket. They will never progress fast enough to be able to challenge, like... Afghanistan and the Netherlands did in this World Cup to challenge the big boys if they're only playing T20 cricket. So it makes no sense at all to, to get rid of that. 50 of them cricket or something similar must remain so that those associates can have bilateral series against stronger international playing nations, build their cricket up, and become better players. If you get rid of that, you will kill the associates. And that cannot be what it's about. You know, ICC has a responsibility to spread the game across the world, not contract it. So I would not want to see um, 50 over cricket removed. So the, the answer for me, for the young lady, is that of what I saw in this tournament suggests to me that 50 over cricket is still required. And the next World Cup, uh, hopefully in 2027, is going to feature 14 teams in two groups of seven. Yes, I mean, that's a step in the right direction. Um, and um, what it means is that those associate sides now can start planning uh, as to how they're going to be on that flight to that next World Cup. So their campaign obviously will be all like now. So it gives them something to aim for. Um, I, I read something recently that there, there has been a complaint and they would like it to remain the same number. I mean, I if that is true, I, I would think that's a step um, in the wrong direction. It's a step backwards. Um, I think we need to be looking to expand um, the, the, the game and, and the World Cup as well. So 14 next time, I, I think that's a good opportunity for the other four countries to work hard and get there. Surely 10 teams is not developing the, the game of cricket, which the ICC surely should be doing. Most definitely not. Because, I mean, you know, 10 teams is, is the same. There, there, there are more than 10 countries that play cricket. So you have to give them the opportunity and the dream to one day um, get there. I mean, if Afghanistan was not given the opportunity, or Sri Lanka, or Bangladesh, or the Netherlands, if they were not given the opportunity those years back uh, to be able to work towards and compete, they would not have been in India 2023 World Cup. So, yeah, ICC, you, you, ICC have to expand, expand the game. They must help the associates to become better. And if you can get the associates, who knows? <clears throat> Nepal could be the next Afghanistan. You just don't know. But those associates need, need the support. 
Well, England are now heading your way for a three-match ODI tour and a five-match T20 tour. They've only selected six of the World Cup squad in the ODI squad, uh, resting some of the players, and some of the players might not play again for England at ODI level. What are your thoughts on the on the tour? Well, I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, from my perspective as a West Indies selector, I am I'm looking forward to the contest because we're very much in the rebuilding stage. So we need we need tough competition, just like all the other sides. So an England side coming to the Caribbean is going to provide tough competition for us, for our players to learn, improve, and, and thrive. So I'm really looking forward to the to the series. And the West Indies have been in T20 form, haven't they, of late? Yeah, you know, we've, we've had a you know a fairly good year in terms of, of our development. Um, it's ongoing. The England series will be a, another part, another stepping stone um, in that improvement. And, you know, the players, staff, management, everybody's really looking forward to, you know, to the series and, you know, testing ourselves against a very strong opponent. And are there some new West Indian players that uh, English listeners his English listeners and viewers should look out for? Yeah, we, we've got a number of um, players in the side this time. Um, obviously, the team... There's quite a lot going on in the Caribbean at this moment in time, which is which would have impacted um, the different teams because currently we have a a team engaged in three test matches in South Africa right now. I think today is the last day of the first test. Um, we've got this series against England, so that's another group of players, um, and obviously there's the Australian series in Australia in. In, in January, so a lot of those players in South Africa are, you know, getting red ball cricket in preparation for that. So, you know, and a, and a number of our players are not available. So, you know, we, we, we've had to utilize a certain number of players, and in within that, you will see at the international level for the first time the likes of um, Shafani Rutherford. Uh, who you would have seen playing CPL and other franchise uh, cricket, and a young uh, Oranga, uh, Matthew Ford. Um, he's 21 years of age. He would have he would have played in the last on the 19 World Cup for West Indies. Um, so those are the two new faces. Um, Justin Graves, who would have played a few games against Ireland a couple of years ago, would have been in this tournament, but after selection, uh, unfortunately didn't recover from from it, from an injury that he picked up um, in the Super 50, 50 competition that was recently concluded and has to miss out. Um, so it's given opportunities for other players to, you know, to be involved, but, you know, we're looking forward to it. It's a real learning curve. And, um, you know, I'm certain that West Indies will do well in this series. Well, thank you for that. And enjoy the, the cricket. You've got some games in Barbados, haven't you? Yeah, it kicks off in um, Antigua, uh, 3rd of December. It's a couple of matches in Antigua. Uh, moved to Barbados, um, where they played in 9th and the 12th. Then go to Grenada. Uh, play two more games in Grenada and then finish off with um, two games in Trinidad. I've got a surprise for you now. I just wanted to ask you about um, a cricketer that sadly passed away at the age of 77 only a, a couple of weeks ago, Bish and Betty. Um I can remember him just watching as being such a beautiful bowler and I wondered whether you'd played against him and I looked up and I found a game in 1977 he probably played against him more than on this one occasion, but playing for the Middlesex side that were the reigning county champions and they were that year going on to win the championship again. What do you remember about a game at Wellingborough School in 1977? Um, you're stretching my um, <laughs> memory. I can, I've got the scorecard yeah. to tell you. So, uh, Well, actually, in fact, I can't remember anything about that game at all. Um, well, I'm um, sure, I'm sure, what, what do you sure remember about Bish and Betty, though? 
before we well, talk Bishop about Betty, that. I, I, Bishop Betty for me was one of the most poetic spin bowlers that I've ever seen. I mean, he was rhythmic. He was very rhythmic. Um, I, I was fortunate to to play um, cricket with Bishop Betty. I I toured Pakistan with a World Eleven, uh, where Bishop Betty was. Um, part of the team and got to know him as a as a man, a very gentle man, um, you know, a magician with a ball. Um, his action was, you know, something he dreamed about. And and a very nice man and a very, you know, I, I can remember um, in Pakistan, there was a, a call out in Pakistan for for someone of a certain um, blood type to give blood to save the life of a young man. And Bishop Bailey immediately came forward as that person. And his blood was the his, his blood type was the, the match and he donated blood and saved the young man's life. Um, you know you know a great man. I I, I have nothing but admiration for him. Um, Enjoyed that tour. Um, you know, he was a lot of fun to talk to, but a great human being and a fantastic bowler. Yeah, 266 test wickets. He played test cricket between 1966 and 1979. So did you play against him on more than one occasion for Middlesex when he was playing for Northampton? Yes, I would have. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure I might have played him before that as well, but um, I certainly played against him a number of times for what was he like to face? Oh, I mean, for sure you didn't get many bad balls. I mean, he had such terrific control of line and length and flight um, as if he was like sleepwalking. You know, he would just run up and, you know, he dropped the ball with perfect pace, perfect flight. The ball would dip at the last minute and land in the right place. I mean, there are not many around if any left arm spinners that I can see around the world that comes anywhere close to Bishop Bailey. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, while I'm talking to you, I'm trying to wrap my brain as to who there is there, but there's no one who comes close. Well, I've got the game in front of me now, which I'm going to talk about very briefly. When you played at uh, Wellingborough School, it was on the 13th, the 15th, so you must have had a JPL game on the 14th and the 16th of August 1977 Middlesex won the toss and decided to field and Northants were bowled out for 179 with John Embry getting five wickets and Phil Edmonds getting three um, Wayne Daniel bowled only six overs and Middlesex went into bat and they were bowled out for 62 in 33 overs uh, Roland Butcher was top scorer with 16 um, Safras bowled one over, and then Bishan Bailey and Peter Willey then both got five wickets. Bishan bowled 16 overs and took five for 24. And then in the second innings, Northampton 217, Embry six, Edmonds four. Daniel didn't bowl a ball. Mike Selby bowled one over. And then in the second innings, Middlesex were bowled out for 206. Roland Butcher, 38, and Bishan got six for 83 off 33 overs. And uh, well, I, I get the impression that that was a turn in pitch then. I, I get the impression, yeah, um, bearing in mind I don't that, think a fast bowler didn't get a wicket in the entire game. Um, that's a good question. Now, Mike Selby, um, he he got two wickets in the first innings for... But, that, but that's Middleton. probably the only two, only two wickets in the, in, in the game. Yeah, they were the only two wickets because um, Ian Gould was absent hurt, so he didn't uh, bat in Middlesex second innings. But uh, So Wayne only bowled six overs in the game. So that tells... And, and if Shafra has only bowled one over in, the, in that innings, that tells you that that very much was a turning pitch. It's not often Middlesex would get bowled out for 62, though, is it, in those days? Well, I mean, against Bishop, there's every chance because... You know, he was not an ordinary bowler by any stretch of the imagination. Especially if, if, if the conditions are helpful to him, that makes it even worse. 
Well, thank you for um, sharing those memories. I, uh, I, I thought you you knew Mission Betty, but I didn't realise you'd been on on tour with him. So uh, we've got to end with your predictions uh, because we probably won't chat again until after the T uh, Twenty World Cup. So uh, who's going to win the T Twenty World Cup? You've got experience because you know the conditions that for this particular competition. So the West Indies, West Indies. We'll win the T20 World Cup. Right. So who are they going to play in the final? So I can only get a finalist out of you then. Well, the finalists, I think the usual suspects will be Australia will be there. So either Australia or yeah, Australia, India, England. I think those three are the Those three will be. One of those three will be the opponents. Right, we look forward to that. And your football team, uh, Stevenage, is still going well. I think they're fourth in the table at the moment. Okay, well, that's good news. I haven't followed them recently, but um, great to see them performing, for sure. Well, that's all for now. Thanks very much, uh, Roland, for talking through the 50-over World Cup. And we look forward now to the T20 World Cup, uh, where England are the reigning champions. Yes, um, you know, they've got to come and defend that title. Um, you'll have a lot of teams trying to take it from them. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to the World Cup. It should be quite exciting. And I'm sure the cricket fans will be looking forward to it as well. And um, we'll see some good cricket. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes in, in the United States as well. Yeah, things will go well there. I mean, I've been to a number of matches in, in Florida already. Um, I think there'll be some games in Texas as well. So. You know what you're going to get in Florida, but you know, we'll have to see how things go in Texas. Right. Well, thank you very much again for being on the paddock and the pavilion. Yes, Stephen, always a great pleasure. And um, look forward to the next time that we can have a conversation. Sports Social Podcast Network. Well, well, well. Shopping for a car? Yep. Carvana made financing a car as smooth as can be. Oh, yeah? I got pre-qualified instantly and had real terms personalized just for me. Hmm, doesn't get much smoother than that. Well, I got to browse thousands of car options on Carvana, all within my budget. Doesn't get much smoother than that. It does. I actually wanted a car that seemed out of my range, but I was able to add a cosigner and found my dream car. It doesn't get much... Oh, it gets smoother. It's getting delivered tomorrow. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get pre-qualified today.